What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode of Hidden Forces is someone I've gotten to know mainly by following his anonymous account on Twitter, where he goes by the name Shrubbery Capital, or Le Shrub for short. He consistently provides some of the most entertaining and clever market commentary you will find anywhere, so I couldn't resist the opportunity to have him on the podcast, especially given the fact that we were both located in the same city and were able to have this conversation in person. Le Shrub and I spend most of the first hour discussing his background, his investment philosophy, and his process for coming up with new trade ideas, as well as his experience shorting the housing market in 2008 as part of a famous team known for doing the big short. What he learned from that experience and how it applies to today's markets are also part of that conversation. The rest of the episode, including the second hour, is a deep dive into many of the topics that are top of mind right now for investors and policymakers alike. We discuss the divergence between bonds and equities, the bull and bear cases for commodities, the fate of emerging markets, the bull and bear cases for different European economies, China, gold, the US dollar, and of course, no conversation is complete today without a discussion about the investment implications of AI and yes, aliens. This is a phenomenal conversation with a brilliant investor. If you want access to all of it and you're not already subscribed to Hidden Forces, you can join our premium feed and listen to the second hour of today's episode by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners, you can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io, and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. Lastly, because this conversation deals with investing, I want to make absolutely clear that nothing I say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guest are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, please enjoy this entertaining and expansive conversation with my guest, Shrubbery Capital's Le Shrub. Le Shrub. Welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you, Dimitri. It's an honor to be here, and I'm really flattered for being invited, and I'm a bit nervous as well. It's so interesting. You look different in person. I was expecting more foliage. Yeah, I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I grew since I left my garden. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, I want to give people a quick some context here because not everyone's on Twitter. You have a very popular, very playful, very funny Twitter account that has blown up in the last few years. And before we get into who you are and your background and you know your actual background, I wanna at least take a moment to understand this side of you because it's the part that most people interact with. So tell me a little bit more about you and your online persona. Yeah, so I went on Twitter during COVID when I was uh, locked in a room uh, and not interacting with people physically. And I was trying to find a cool name and I and I'm a fan of Monty Python and the Holy Grail and the knights who say knee that they, you know, all they wanted was a shrubbery. So, and I, and I thought, well, you know, shrubbery, it sounds a lot like, shrubbery is a good hedge. It makes for a good hedge. So a shrubbery is like a wordplay for a hedge fund. So I just, uh, so I went with shrubbery capital and I really enjoyed that. And also there was like a more philosophical aspect to it. Like the knights of knee, they're quite powerful, but all they want is a shrubbery. <laughs> So in a way, you know, we're fighting for all these things in life, but actually, you know, you're going to be really happy just having a shrubbery. <laughs> so I went with that and then the shrubbery capital became shorted to Le Shrub because it's, I live in Monaco, so it's more uh, in tune with the cultural <laughs> environment. Yeah. It's also interesting how the internet has created all sorts of new manifestations of human culture and like the sort of the anonymous Twitter account 
parody account especially, funny accounts, have become a sort of source of joy and happiness for all of us. And the stuff that you put out is so funny. And what's really especially unique about you is your, I mean, a lot of people are good in, at memeing, but you're really good at memeing in finance. And so I was saying on Twitter that this was the first time I ever prepared for an episode where I relied exclusively. I would say exclusively. I wouldn't even say semi-exclusive. I relied exclusively on memes. So we're going to get into some of your sort of memetic ideas or your meme ideas or whatever it is, memetic, memetic. But before we do that, I'm curious to learn more about you and how you got into finance, markets, and investing. What's your background? Sure. So before I became uh, Le Shrub on Twitter, <laughs> I used to be a hedge fund manager. <laughs> so I grew up in Cyprus. I went to the army and then I, um, I went to study engineering and economics and management at Oxford University. I paid my dues in investment banking at Lazard. And then I got a job working for one of the successful hedge funds of the 2008 crisis. It's one of the hedge funds that became um, very well known for the big short. And that's where I really learned to work on special situations. And, uh, you know, I, I basically honed my skills in uh, event-driven investing, but also thematic investing. I basically le learned from nothing when I was there. And then I embarked in a career from there. I was a portfolio manager for uh, another uh, one or two hedge funds. And now I run a family office in Monaco where I cover pretty much every asset class. And because I work alone, I basically enjoy being on Twitter, you know, being in a room and studying all the markets. I enjoy being on Twitter because I can interact with other like-minded people who might not be in finance. And in some way, the interesting thing about Twitter is that it allowed me to recreate a collegiate atmosphere of a hedge fund, but in a more global scale. And actually, I managed to find, you know, experts in fields that I wouldn't otherwise be in a hedge fund. So it gives me freedom being on uh, Twitter. But yeah, so, so my background is basically 15 to 16 years in hedge funds. I made and lost money in pretty much every asset class, made all the mistakes. Hopefully I minimize the mistakes going forward. I still make them, but I just try to lose less money <laughs> as I go along. So after you left the hedge fund you were at, and I don't know if you can tell us what it was, but after you left that hedge fund, did you, is that when you started something on your own? And what led you to want to, if that's what you did, because I'm not entirely sure, what led you to want to I was do working that? as a portfolio manager in, a, in another major event fund and a platform. When you transitioned? When I transitioned you... from the big short fund. Mm. Yeah, I was like for another six, seven years a portfolio manager. And now I run a family office. I'm the CIO of the family office pretty much. So what did you learn from that experience navigating the 2008 financial crisis? Absolutely. So it was really the most exciting part of my career. And it's also something very dangerous because a lot of us who lived through that, we have a PDSD from the GFC. I was one of the lucky ones because we actually made a lot of money during, <laughs> during that period. But I was basically focused on special sits, whereas the fund was short subprime. And there was a lot of lessons that we can carry forward from that till today. And one of the lessons is how to structure a trade that is bearish, because there is part of this period that's reminiscent to 2006, seven. The period that we're in today. Yeah. So it's worth actually just going back to that because you know, a lot of people on Twitter in the markets, they like to be bearish and it's like doom and gloom and everything is going to blow up. And I just want to go through 2006, 7, 8, how we structured the trade, hoping that people are going to learn how a really good trade is structured hmm. in the bearish way. So the hedge fund I worked in was, you know, it's a very famous fund. I would say the founder was a genius, is a genius. And we were an event-driven fund and we were running a billion between eight people, 10 people. And the founder and uh, his right-hand man, they were bearish on the subprime market. Going back how far? This is 2006. And how did they develop their thesis on that? Do you, is there a sort of rough... So look, the thing is, and it's going to go to the structuring of the trade. So there were a lot of people that were short subprime from earlier on. They could see it. They, I mean, you know, the smartest guys put the trade on two years before it actually happened and they blew up. So our guys... My ex-boss, he figured out the trade in 2005, six, I would say, because it was obvious, you know, we were at a, at a rate hiking cycle back then as well, like, like now. And uh, if you remember, yields on real estate were negative. Like the writing was on the wall. It wasn't anything, 
I mean, you see the film afterwards. And they were adjustable rate mortgages then. Adjustable rate. I mean, you can see a lot of parallels. Like the UK market today, for example, mm. is a negative yield market. So another simple example. So the writing was on the wall. But, you know, the market was in uh, a euphoric moment and everyone thought that subprime is contained. Great. So the way we structured the trade was we were an event-driven fund. We were making 10% a year on average, on a good year, 20%. So we put an insurance policy that would cost us 1% a year for this subprime trade. And if it worked out, we would make a lot of money. If it didn't work out, we would lose 1%. That was the cost of the insurance. That was the cost of the insurance. So we put the trade on and the trade lost money every month for one year while I was there. And then suddenly that 10 bips that we were losing every month made like 1% and then the next day 1% and the next day 1% and then it just blew through the roof and then it just exploded. So going back to lessons for your listeners and myself going forward. <laughs> when you have a bearish stance, you want to structure a trade in a way that you don't blow up. The mistake that a lot of the people did in 2007 was going like, if there was Twitter back then, all these guys in 2004, 5, 6, they would have all blown up uh, shorting subprime as well. <laughs> because they'd be like all in short and they would blow up. Which, like I said, we had a lot of peers that didn't make it to see the trade work. And I, actually, Michael Berry, who's turned famous out of it, you know, he had a close call. So, you know, I'm sorry to Michael, a great guy, but, you know, he didn't structure it as smartly as they make it look like. Whereas, you know, credit to my boss that I'm eternally grateful for, he risk managed his trade. And the genius part about what became known as the greatest trade in the world was that you would lose 1% to make X. You know, we actually made a lot more than we thought we would make. Mm. So to have exposure to a really great absolutely so convex outcome. Yeah. So shorting, by the way, as a caveat, shorting anything is the worst idea in the world. Because shorting, you have unlimited losses to make hundred percent. So shorting is a terrible idea. But because of the way it was structured with a premium, you would just spend your premium or short something that had like when you short a bond is different than shorting an equity. Because let's put it this way, quick lesson for those who are not familiar, but you know, say you short a stock at 100, the stock can go to 1,000. So you blow up, you're 10 times away. If you short a bond at 100, the most you can lose is 100 and the coupon that's on the bond plus the borrow cost. So say it's, if the coupon is five, you'll lose five plus two, the borrow cost 7% a year. So that's why shorting subprime was a very asymmetric trade because you, you capped your loss and your upside was multiples. Mm. So going back to the lessons of today versus the lessons back then is if you're bearish and I try to make this point because I, you know, I try to address some of my tweets to help retail investors not blow up in some way. It's like, it's very different shorting stocks when VIX is 18 and buying puts when VIX is 18. On one side, you can lose a lot of money. On the other side, you know what you're losing. So back to the subprime trade, we knew what we were losing. And at the same time, we were making a lot of money from our other trades. So my focus was actually initially making money on the event side. So the trades on the event side ended up making 15, 20% a year. Which more than covered the cost a, of the you insurance. Know, the whole team, not, not obviously. And it was covering the cost of the insurance. So fast forward to today, that's how I'm trying to position my trades. I always try to have something that makes income to finance the insurance cost. And I think it's really underappreciated by the media and by you know the big personalities because they all have like every kid in finance wants to be George Soros breaking the Bank of England. Mm. It's not like that. You know the real trade is to be asymmetric, to have like stay in the game. You know you're not George Soros. <laughs> stay in the game and just position for when you see the asymmetry, you just put the chips on the table and that's it. Mm. The other trade that came out of it actually just again parallels to today was, and this is the trade that we put on in Europe at the time that was very successful, is if you see a big event happening, like subprime, there's always like a second derivative hmm. that can make a lot of money somewhere else. So Bank equity. Yeah, bank equity. So what we ended up doing in Europe, because we actually tried to see how you could short European subprime and we couldn't do it. And then we realized, well, hold on, these European banks are full of subprime. So we ended up shorting a bunch of European banks and we made a killing out of them. So... 
again, it's, I mean, the best example of a special sits trade was RBS bought ABN AMRO at the time. And I was a merger ARB guy. And, uh, you know, if you looked at the pro forma after they bought the bank, they had like 1% equity against the assets. And then you looked at the assets and it had like 100 billion of CMBS and RMBS and crap that was marked at 100. And if you marked it to market, well, the bank was had negative equity by three to five times or something, if I remember correctly. So these are the second derivative trades from a crisis. I mean, we saw this again this year with SVB, you know, the people were looking at bonds blowing up, but very few people saw that SVB had duration risk and blew up. I, I mean, I missed it as well because I actually hate investing in banks nowadays. So, so I, I missed that trade completely. So so that's, that's the second part of, uh, you know, second lesson of the period that you can always have a second derivative trade that people will figure out down the line. Mm. It's also very interesting how the people you hear about are those who make some kind of public call, but it's really in the execution that the money is made. Because just the saying that you know that the mortgage market is going to blow up, but not knowing how to structure the trade so that you don't get wiped out in the process of actually putting it on or trying to keep it on is actually what really matters in practice. Oh, absolutely. And also, and there's always the, uh, <laughs> actually, there's a third lesson out of this. There's always the guys that structure the first trade correctly. They get the euphoria from the first trade and they mess up the second trade. So like I said, there was a cohort of our peers that blew up before subprime blew up. So they were short subprime and they blew up before subprime actually blew up. Well, there was a second cohort that blew up by going long subprime before subprime recovered. <laughs> so, so again, it's the structuring element. So you hear about, so there was one guy who actually nailed it. I can't remember his name, but he made a fortune in 08. And then he blew up his fund because he went long too early. So again, because on the first trade, he structured it correctly. He was like, <laughs> he capped his downside. But on the second trade, he didn't cap well, his downside. That guy's very ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's also interesting how, and this, I was telling you this before, we've talked before about this, that you know, I'm not a, whatever term you want to use, I'm not a professional investor. I'm, I'm a professional other things, but this is not what I'm a professional at doing. But I speak to people who are. And my interest in this field came both from what I studied in college. I studied one of my degrees was in economics, and I just had, had a fascination about markets. There was something about the behavioral element, the sort of complex, dynamic, nonlinear feedback system, nature of the system that interested me. But as I've gotten older, I've you know had to develop some basic skill sets around it. And I speak to a lot of smart people, so I try to get lessons from them. And one of the things that I learned that was like one of the most important lessons I learned. It's such a simple one is that you can't think in terms of binary outcomes. You really have to think in terms of like likelihoods and also about in terms of risk management. Absolutely. This is, I mean, as an event-driven guy, I have to say that because I've spent more than a decade doing merger arbitrage as well. So it's mm -hmm. part of the special sits mandate is merger arbitrage. And merger arbitrage is a perfect example where, you know, you risk 10 to make one. Mm. So you better get your probabilities right. So the one, the first lesson they teach you in, in merge arbitrage is you're better off investing in a deal where you can make, where you risk 10 to make one that has 99% probability than to bet on a deal that has risk one to make one, but it's 50-50. Mm. So again, to your point, it's always about probabilities and risk management and also not blowing up on a on a black swan. So <laughs> because the black swan is always there. I mean, I have a lot of black swans if you want. <laughs> so. Yeah, or gray swans. What does event-driven investing look like in practice? Event-driven investing is basically looking for catalysts. So there's a few aspects to it. So the purest form is merge arbitrage, where you bet on a deal closing or not closing, an announced deal. That's the purest form. Like for example, Elon buying Twitter. Elon buying Twitter. So and you know, that's a very good example because you have legal risk, you have crazy man risk, <laughs> you have mm. a lot of risks around it. So you have to put probability on those risks and you have to see how much you're risking. And actually, Twitter was a very asymmetric risk reward. You, you were making a lot of money by betting on the outcome. And actually, merger arbitrage, it's a very interesting strategy because in the past, you could make 20% IRRs. So in the 90s, I would say it was 20% IRRs. By the 2000s, when I started, it was 15, 12%. Then it was like 5, 6%. And then in COVID, it became 20. And then it became five again. And then it became 20 again. So it's a very cyclical space. And because it's very crowded, like if you, when you hear hedge fund hotel, mm -hmm. merger arbitrage is the absolute hedge fund hotel. And that's why it's, it's fun 
because now I'm an outsider, I have a more wide mandate. It's fun watching merger ARB situations from the outside. And there's actually a lot of money to be made by just watch, staying on the outside and waiting for the hedge funds to tilt on one side and puke a situation out of mm. it. And there's always something happening. Like COVID was a perfect example. Lately, there was uh, an antitrust situation. Well, actually, lately it was the Activision, Microsoft situation. So there's always something that makes it fun. But, you know, for someone having done it for like, uh, you know, 15 years, it's also a very tiring one because you wake up and you read all the filings and you have to just stay on top of everything. So mm -hmm. so I'm just happier to be diversified right now. <laughs> so so um, one of the things I've gotten to understand about you is that you have a lot of fun. You enjoy what you do. What is it about what you do that you find so enjoyable? I absolutely love what I do. And I think if you ask me what's my one of my strengths, it, it's actually that I enjoy my job and I enjoy, I even enjoy like, uh, you know, the shrub on Twitter, <laughs> the combination of it. You know, I, I love learning. I love reading. I love knowledge. And the fun thing about our job is that you pick up a new situation and you just learn new things. It keeps you young in some way. Like, you know, people see Buffett and Charlie Munger. I mean, yeah. there's, there's like a hundred year old guys, <laughs> Charlie right? Munger's a hundred years old. Yeah. And you see these guys and you're like, how can Buffett be so cheerful? It's like, yeah, because the guy is like, I think he's constantly learning. Like he's excited, you know, the guy's, he invested in Occidental and I'm sure he invested in Occidental because he remembered in the seventies, here's what I think about Occidental. So in the seventies, it was a stagflationary seventies. The best performing sector was energy. It did the best out of a stagflationary environment. There was an energy crisis. So there's a lot of parallels between today and the seventies with a stagflationary energy crisis environment. And in the seventies, Buffett had his worst year. He was down 50%. So I reckon Buffett channeled his memory bank and is like, you know what? I'm not going to fall for it this time. So he loaded up on energy stocks because he remembered the 70s. That's just my guess. But going back to the point, to keep a guy that's worth, I don't know how many billions interested, why is he doing it? He's not doing it for money. He loves it. Yeah. And it keeps him interested. It keeps his brain sharp. So that's what I love about this job. It keeps your brain sharp. It keeps you going. And uh, there's another aspect as well. It's quite funny on Twitter, sometimes people say, well, you're switching between topics, you know, the, oh, you switch from, like people on Twitter become experts on the uh, sure, topic course. du jour. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like the energy, the war in Ukraine, then it's COVID. So you, you know, you start by getting a PhD in uh, biology and then you get a PhD in uh, chemistry and then you get a PhD on uh, yeah. war, <laughs> PhD in Ukraine. Now we're going to get a PhD on uh, alien life forms and uh, superconductors. But, yeah, exactly. So, I was going to say superconductors is the most recent one. Oh, yeah. So for example, I've spent- And reflective we, surface paint. Yeah. So be, before we started the interview, I was actually spending a few hours reading about superconductors. And what's your view on that? And catch people up on, by the way, just a quick interjection. I did the math some time ago. In the 1970s, Charlie Munger was older than you and I, significantly older. And he was graduating high school before Mickey Mantle was even out of elementary school. That's how old the guy is. He's older than Mickey Mantle. So it's pretty amazing. But for our listeners, give the background here on this. And then I'm curious to hear what you have learned in the process of doing this deep dive. Because I discovered about this like last week. I'm assuming yeah. you it came to- came No, no, I, I actually- it's, You've no, known about I, it. I've dis no, I discovered about this three hours ago. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So I, and I, I saw it first on already. thread. Oh, and I okay. put a trade already. So this is actually a really great opportunity. Yeah, so look, Walk so, us through this. So it's very simple. So just to finish up this theory about being an expert in everything. You become an expert on something quickly. That's the whole fun of investing because you catch up on something very quickly and you have to put a trade on. So it's not like you just read about it and you put it in your drawer. No, you read about it, you do the work, and then you actually have From to theory put to a practice. trade. That's why investing is difficult and fun. And sometimes it becomes easy once you know all these things and you become Buffett's and Charlie's age. So for example, you know, the energy crisis in... Uh, 2022, I, I had experience in energy stocks before. I knew them from COVID. So when it happened, I could put a trade on and I got myself familiarized with a lot of things or or let's do the superconductor thing. You know, I saw the, the news uh, this morning on my way here. Well, the superconductor, so that, that would change everything. You basically have something that superconducts in room temperature and ambient temperature. Well, that means you can make supercomputers, quantum computers viable in a room. Yeah, there's less energy loss. Less it's energy much loss, more efficient, and also transfer. you know, with what's the material that's used? Lead and sulfur. Where's the copper? <laughs> so it opens up a lot of a lot of interesting. That's aspects. amazing. Yeah. So imagine having a supercomputer in your room. I mean, 
people are going to be like, and you know, there was a, immediately there was a dismissal from people. It's like, oh, that is nonsense. It's too early. It's too early. Yeah, but hold on. There's a paper out there. Even if it's a 20% chance that it works, this is going to be immense. So what did I do? So I started reading about this. Okay, this is amazing. It's negative copper, but I'm not going to bet on copper. doesn't matter. It's bullish lead, but there's a lot of lead in the world. It's bullish sulfur. Who cares about sulfur? But it's really, really bullish about supercomputers. So, it's so interesting, by the way, just to point out, like the way you begin to pick apart yeah. the way in which- Yeah, you break it up. Yeah. Yeah. You break it up and you start thinking, what's the obvious trade? And this is where you actually sometimes have to dumb down a bit. So you, you either have to dumb down or become like a genius level. Now, I don't have a chance to become a genius level. So sometimes I try to dumb down. It's like the bell curve, maybe. Yeah, it's a bell curve. So I'm not going to be on the right-hand side. I'm going to be on... I mean, I studied engineering, by the way, so I shouldn't... You should <laughs> but, be on the right-hand side. But still, I'm like, I'm like the worst engineer in the world. I mean, my wife does all the fixings in the house, so <laughs> it's outsourced. <laughs> but so I have this funny saying on Twitter, you have to keep it kiss, keep it simple shrub. <laughs> so, so you have to just keep it simple. Semiconductor, people are talking about it. What's the obvious trade? Supercomputers. So you find out who's benefiting from supercomputer, you put a trade on. There's probably going to be momentum for X. It could be a momentum for one day, one month, one year, depending how it plays out. But, you know, I actually have a trade on and I'm just going to see how it plays out and I'm going to educate myself. Right. So you're in the education along. phase and yeah. the, you're putting the trade on as part of helping but you accomplish that. I have a trade on. So yeah, I have a trade on. I actually have a trade on right now that I will look to scale up or scale down depending on what I learn in the process. Why is that important to have a trade on when oh, you're, when you're your in the learning process? Skin in the game. Explain the mechanics of that. What is Absolutely. it about having skin in the game that it accelerates you. your learning? So I'm on holiday now. I'm on the beach every day. If I don't have skin in the game, I'm just going to stay on the beach every day. I'm going to run after the kids and have my iced coffee. So whereas if you have skin in the game, it forces you to sit down. I mean, because you get excited, but then you kind of put it in the back of your mind. So if you have skin in the game, it forces you to speed up your process because it's your money. I mean, it's my money on the line. I kind of respect my money. Although I do allow myself to gamble a bit. <laughs> but, you know, you have skin in the game, it keeps you going. But also the other thing that it stops you from doing, once you scale a trade, it stops you from having FOMO if the trade gets away from you. And that's actually a very important thing that I've learned in my time as an investor, that if you buy a first position, so say I bought a 1% position in this quantum computer company, if it's up 50% the next day, I'm not going to cry because I made 50 bips. If it's you're not going to focus on how you wish you would put more into the trade. You're going to say that, of course, because it's human nature, but you actually have more money in your pocket. So that's pretty good. So that's the difference. You're going to say, oh my God, I wish, you know, could mm -hmm. I, should I, would I put 10% of my fund in this life, but you wouldn't do it anyway. <laughs> so, so you just say, you know what? I'm grateful, God. Thank you very much for the, as they say, for the 10 Ds on Reddit. <laughs> so, and then you can move on. And then you can actually, if you have some PL, you actually feel more confident putting more money on the trade. But imagine if you don't have any skin in the game and the trade runs away from you the next day, well, you end up chasing and you, and actually, when I was younger, what I would do is I would see it go up the next day and I'm like, ah, I'm going to wait the next day. And mm -hmm. then it would just go up more and ah, I'm going to wait up the next day. And then you end up top ticking the... Yeah, it's amazing how that works. Oh, it's amazing, but it's Todd's law. Of course, it's going to happen like that. I mean, it still happens, by the way. Sometimes I just see the stock is like, why did I buy this? <laughs> it just keeps going. It's human nature. It's human nature. And this is part of our journey as investors. And that's, you know, that's why actually... You know, I love listening to your stuff because it's a journey of the soul that's multifaceted. It's not like a one-dimensional journey. It's about controlling your emotion, controlling your confidence. You had this uh, yeah, Peter podcast Atwater. with Peter Atwater. Yeah. Like, confidence mm -hmm. is a major strength for an investor because you're entering the arena. It's like entering, like when the, I see it this way, if you want to see it like a bit more romantically, it's like when the bell rings and the market opens, it's like you're entering the gladiator's arena and everyone in there wants to kill you. Hmm. So you got to enter the arena with confidence. And you know, you have to enter with confidence and a bit of humility as well because sometimes, you know, the guy that comes in with without humility is a guy who gets punched in the face. I mean, it happened to me many times. <laughs> so investing is a journey of the self as well, and it's a philosophical journey. And actually being on Twitter and tweeting out, like I sometimes I t live tweet my trades and I'm quite careful that I don't mention, you know, small caps and things like that. But, you know, I tweet my trades, it makes me more confident in some way. 
mm. when I tweet a trade out. And the reason it makes me more confident on the trade is I have this funny thing. I imagine that an old lady is reading my tweet and she knows nothing about finance. And I'm like, mm. if the old lady reads my tweet and puts money in it and she loses money, I'm going to feel bad. So I better not tweet something stupid. Mm. <laughs> so that's why mm. it makes me accountable when I put a trade out. And it gives me confidence as well to size up sometimes. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's a really great way of looking at it. I think also, at least for me, and it's not so much for when it comes to putting out opinions about trades, that's not something that I do. But when it comes to all of my public communication, what I have found about being honest and transparent is that it helps you not to get lost. You're kind of very clear on what you believe and what you don't believe, and you don't fall into the trap of creating a story that doesn't align with the facts. The other thing that I think is also important, at least for me again, and not when it comes to investing, but when it comes to just having an opinion in the world is don't have too strong an opinion unless you really feel absolute conviction around it. Because I think what ends up happening is you end up getting wedded to the opinion and wanting to be right. And it causes you to make major mistakes. See, that's very important. So this is one of the benefits of having a shrub persona in some ways. Mm. By the way, I, I think it was one trader said strong opinions loosely held. Mm. I yes, think it was, exactly correct. I, think, I can't remember who said that. I think it was Peter Brand who was a technical trader who yeah, was in maybe, the market maybe. wizards. Market wizards. Maybe, yeah. but that's a brilliant way of yeah. putting it. Absolutely. Strong opinions loosely held. So actually what you said for me is how most funds blow up in a way. Why? And going back to the shrub persona. So imagine like a very well-known hedge fund manager he bets his whole fund on a trade and he's written a hundred page presentation on the one trade and the trade goes against him. What's the guy going to do? He's going to stick to the trade. Mm -hmm. And if the trade is down 20- His ego's invested in his ego's alongside invested with in his it. money. It's not his money mostly, it's the other investor's money, especially if he's making 220. Okay, he's lost some, but the guy's going to make 2%, so he's going to be okay. But this is actually one of the plagues of hedge funds and investors when they get wed married to an opinion and they become synonymous with that trade. That's why I brought the, how we structured the subprime trade as an example, that it was a very high conviction trade, but it wasn't gonna blow us up. So there's a lot of hedge funds that blow up by having high conviction trades, badly timed or wrongly sized. It happens every day almost. Now, if I had a fund and I was marketing to investors, you kind of like, you know, you're tied up to that trade. Now imagine if you're like a shrub on Twitter and you put a trade out. It's much easier to say you're wrong, right? Mm. Than instead of being like George Soros and say, well, I'm wrong. <laughs> so, Is that how it feels for you? No, it makes it, I'll put it this way. There's a certain level of distance there, between there's you. There's a distance. Yeah, there's a distance. Because I always say, look, I make it clear, I'm wrong all the time. So, and it's good to say that you're wrong too. Wrong it's, it's a really time. healthy yeah. way to I'm sort of relate to I, your yeah. decision making. I'm wrong all the time. Like I have years when I'm really right and I have years when I'm really wrong. And it's about losing less money when I'm on those years and not losing much when I'm wrong. It's, it's as simple mm. as that. It's nothing more complicated than that. Making more from your winners than you lose from your losers and not get it to your earlier point, I think this is the plague, is getting married to an opinion. When you get married to an opinion without risk management, then I think you're done. I mean, you can make a lot of examples, you know, the tech bulls in 2022, the energy bulls in 2023. Mm. Like if you go to a hundred podcasts and you bet your reputation on the direction of the market or the direction of oil, the direction of gold, and you're wrong, you kind of want to stick to it. I mean, there's people that have been bearish for 20 years, right? Yeah. So, I mean, those people, they can only, I don't know, sell a newsletter about gold, but they do it, right? So. It's very frustrating. I mean, again, like it's what's interesting in this conversation is where you come from and where I come from, but we spend so much time in the same circles, in the same places, right? You come to it as an investor. I come to it as, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, a content, a media entrepreneur, a content creator, a storyteller. And uh, it's very frustrating to see how the incentives work in media and the benefit of conveying a sense of certainty that you really don't, don't have or should have in terms of getting eyeballs, getting attention. And so many of the media cycles really are driven off of that level of certainty, just waves and waves of it. Absolutely. I mean, it's much more 
easy for you. I mean, you can grow a massive following if you all just say Absolutely. the market is going to crash, 1987 crash coming next week. Yeah. And people don't remember. The thing is, no. it's very easy. I mean, I forget. <laughs> I've been around long enough where I know people and I see them, they're out there today. And I'm like, didn't you have a completely different opinion that you never explained like just a few years ago? You know, and didn't you have a completely different, different opinion, you know, several years before that? And I've never heard you explain how you got to where you are. I've never understood the transition, you know? But so that, that's the thing that's also very interesting, which is we 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 exist in this area where there's a whole sort of ecosystem of people that put out content about this thing, investing, and then there are a bunch of people that actually invest. And the sort of layman that walks in this marketplace would assume that these two people are the same, but they're not. You know? Absolutely. And Absolutely. part of the reason is it's very difficult to do one when you're doing the other for the reasons that we described. So to that point, I mean, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of people and, and someone who, when I was... Um, when I was interviewing him, Howard Marks, I remember one of the things that struck me about him was his demeanor and his level of calm. And I had asked him, you know, what, and this is what I'm asking you, which is what are some of the qualities that make a good investor? Because you talked about working for someone who was a genius. You know, what was it about your former boss that made him a good investor? And where does temperament sit in all of that? Yeah, I think calmness is a very important quality. A calmness in a way that can be taught or in a way that really can't be taught? I think it has to be a character, but it can be improved. Hmm. To your, uh, our previous point about Atwater and the stress center and knowing where yeah, you are. Absolutely. I mean, if people haven't listened to that, I really recommend people to listen to it because it really builds up on you as an investor, the, you know, the confidence and the calmness. So my boss at the time, he was a very calm person. And if the market was down X, he really wouldn't flinch because he's seen it before, but he wouldn't flinch. And actually the only... This is the interesting part. If we were down a few percent of trade or he never told me off on anything except once. The only time he told me off was when it was not on a losing trade. It was actually a very profitable trade. And he thought that I did a mistake in the accounting, calculating the shareholder equity of that bank. And then he was shouting at me and then once he realized he was he did a mistake, he turned to the others and said, oh, you know what, Shrub, uh, he did a great job with this trade, with the analysis, not with the trade, with the analysis mm. of this bank. So back to my point is, the guy was calm. This is the, the takeaway. The guy was calm about making or losing money. But what he cared about was that the analysis mm. was correct. That you were right for the right reasons. Yes, that's what he cared about. That's the takeaway of the story. Mm. You have to make sure your analysis is correct. He didn't care about the PL. The PL was insane, by the way. But he cared about the analysis. And that was the only time he shouted at me. And he never shouted at me about a losing trade. You know, I, I love that. And I've also taken that away from the smartest people I've ever interviewed, which is that it's you're okay to be wrong for the right reasons. And it's important to understand why you're wrong. Because if you don't understand, you can lose control. And right, because we're talking about something that's really dangerous. Absolutely. You know, it's like being a test pilot. You could blow up and that's it. Your career's over. Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. That's why you need a high, there's one thing you need to have a high standard in is, is your analysis. And I'm not talking about, your analysis doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be, because I'm an engineer by background. So it's not about being perfect. It's about being the right approach. Like I love using first principles. I always approach things from a first principle perspective. So your analysis has to be crystal clear and correct, not perfect, just correct approach. I mean, nowadays I say that the perfect trade fits on a tweet now. That's how I would like to distill it down. Like the perfect trade fits on a tweet. And I have this joke in my shrub uh, Twitter account that occasionally I tweet out ideas. It's called shrubs corner of the FT. So I would write trades on the corner of the FT. I would say a trade, a great trade should fit in the corner of the FT weekend. So I would take the FT weekend and try and summarize a trade <laughs> in the corner of the FT. And I've done it a few times and it was fun. And it, you know, usually is okay. Is that because it, it's a commentary on how clear you are on why you're putting on that trade? Yeah, it's because it's... If it's so simple that it fits on the corner of the FT or in a tweet, mm. then everyone's going to get it. But it has to be something beyond like, oh, it's 10 times earnings. Mm. Or, you know, so it has to be like something that may be overlooked or buried somewhere mm. or something that people are not paying attention to. 
I can give you an example of the past, you know, so of the past. So it was, I did Valaris, which is an offshore rig company. Mm. So, you know, they have big rigs. It's a crappy industry. Everyone blew in this industry in the last 10 years. But these guys came out of a bankruptcy. They had a clean balance sheet. And each rig was getting like 200,000 a day. So these, these are like expensive stuff to rent. And I did the corner of, T, of the FT analysis that, look, this thing is expensive now, 200,000 a day. But if you put it at 500,000, which is where it's going to go with the offshore rig market titans, well, it's trading on three times EBITDA. Mm. And you know, today, the rig rates are 500,000. So again, it's a very simple sensitivity, but it focuses the mind on mm. what's important. It's just a simple example. I love that. So we're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed shrub. But uh, before we do, we're recording this on Thursday, July 27th, I think. And actually, I should mention, if people haven't figured it out, we're in person. I think people did figure that out. But we're actually in person in my favorite studio in Athens, which is a, a converted cinema. And it's absolutely stunning. It's amazing. Being here. I'm loving it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my question is, before we move it to the premium feed, this is, you know, we got the Fed rate hike decision yesterday. As you know, we talked about this as well. I try not to spend too much time talking about the Fed because one of the realities is that when you're creating content, you have a need to create a certain amount of content. And that ends up creating a situation where people talk about stuff that isn't actually newsworthy, but you just need something to be out there. And the Fed is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. It's like a ritualistic thing. Every time the Fed has a rate decision, everyone starts of just talking about it. Everyone wants to say what's going to happen. And I also wonder to what degree it's even relevant, you know, what the Fed does. Yeah, but look, let's refer to uh, this uh, very famous book, The Reminiscences of a Shrub Operator, <laughs> written, by, <laughs> written by the shrub. <laughs> so it's, it's a joke that I tweet things out as if it's the experiences of a trader <laughs> called the shrub who wrote a book called Reminiscences of a Shrub Operator. So what is a Fed day? The Fed day is a day where put and call premium goes to die. <laughs> mm. And it's a commemoration where traders like to lose money in premium. So on Fed day, I actually went for a very nice barbecue with my family on the beach. <laughs> and I just read this morning the summary. I, you know, I used to listen to the guys, but you know, I, again, I, as a joke, I said, what is Central Bank Week is basically... It's a commemoration where central banks come together and whoever, you know, the winner is the one who lies the most convincingly and the market believes them. <laughs> so yeah, it's relevant, but is it really? I mean, the guy came out yesterday being hawkish saying we're going to, inflation is going to come down to 2% by 2025, mm. which is really hawkish actually. Mm. And we're not going to cut rates this year, which is again hawkish. And he said a five hawkish things, but the market's up. Why? Well, because of what I said earlier, everyone bought puts for the event. There's so much positioning in these things that sometimes you just want to wait for them to clear out. And I'm guilty of it many times. I sit down and I play these events and I watch the guys, you know, I think, oh, there's going to be a hawkish Fed. It's like, yeah, there is a hawkish Fed, but the market's up. Why? Well, because everyone's positioned for it. <laughs> so. Is everyone just too impatient to see the tightening economic conditions play out in the economy? In other yeah, words, of it, course, yeah. because it's TikTok investing. Hmm. We live in... So again, uh, I think it's, in, again, in reminiscences of a shrub operator, I think he described the TikTok investing. <laughs> <laughs> so we became ADHD sufferers and we all became TikTok investors in some way. And it's a function of the market. Like the market is driven by short-term investors. The biggest players in the market are now pot shops, you know, like Millennium and Point72 and Algos. So these guys, they exacerbate the, the intraday move. So they make people impatient as well. And in some way, you actually want to step back and take the opposite structure right now, sure. But we became impatient because of the structure. And it really pays off to pull back and take the opposite view some, in some ways. I think that's why Buffett's famous quote, right? They ask, uh, I think it was Jeff Bezos. He asked him, why isn't everyone rich like you if all you do is buy good companies? And they said, well, because no one wants to get rich uh, slowly. So... It's the same mm. thing. And I, look, I'm guilty of it as well because I do a lot of uh, short-term trades as well. Mm. So where do I want to get to in my life? Because I'd like to think I'm still young. I would like to get to that Buffett, Charlie Munger mentality. And it, it's not easy, by the way. It's not easy. Some people are more blessed with it than mm. others. But you know, for me, it's actually a struggle to get there. To be measured. To be to measured. To not overextend yourself, to not YOLO. 
Yeah, it's tempting. So the way I do it, so look, the way an investor can create, I've created safeguards around me to protect myself. I'm going to say some really stupid things now that you're going to be surprised, but the way I trade, I trade, I don't have an online account. Hmm. I have an online account, which is a punt account. So that money is like, it's the equivalent amount of money for me as like buying a lottery ticket. And I just do that stupid thing there. That's very smart. Yeah, I do stupid things there. And I say, you know what? That's a zero from the beginning. But then my main account is online and by phone. On, sorry, online, as in email and phone. And the reason I have it like that is because it forces you to type it in get it to another human, and then discuss it with a human on the phone. It's like the nuclear launch codes. Exactly. There are other yeah. people in the loop. Yeah, because look, I'm not perfect. And I try, the whole point is to create safeguards against your own stupidity. What's the biggest enemy we have? It's our own stupidity, right? And my account on Twitter became, you know, one of the, one of the mottos I had was, don't be stupid. Mm. So it's about, we are stupid, but try not to be mm. stupid and help yourself. Like introduce safeguards, like... You know, one way would be, for example, if you tell your wife all your trades, I mean, that's a pretty good safeguard. <laughs> or, you mm. know, if you look your kids in the face and say, ah, sh you know, crap, I yoloed some, <laughs> mm. I yoloed your education away, <laughs> for example. So, <laughs> so, you know, these are good safeguards. Sorry, sorry Johnny, you're not going to college <laughs> sorry. this year. <laughs> oh, you'll make more money as a plumber, but... <laughs> 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 it's a smarter, it's a smarter, uh, you, you sell it as a, a sort of better use of their money. You know, to bring it back to Jesse Livermore, or Jesse Liverstein, depends on which uh, we want to use the alias or his actual name, in uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, one of the lessons he learned that he shares in that book is to know whether you're in a bull market or in a bear market. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So yeah. are we in a new bull market or are we in a corrective phase of a larger bear market? Oof, tough question. Because the way I like to think about it is there's always a bull market somewhere. There's always a bull market somewhere and there's always a bear market somewhere. So let's do the bull market. The energy space underwent a singularity with the war in Ukraine. So you could argue that created, that triggered a new bull market in energy. And we went through a pretty deep correction in the last 12 months. Mm. And now it's resumed a bit. So you can argue, and you know, oil companies at 70 to 90 dollar oil, they're actually making a lot of money. So you can argue that we have like a decent bull market in energy. Tech stocks. Tech stocks we're actually in a bear market the last 12 months. And there was a trigger that's changed all that, and that was AI. And unfortunately, going back to being a generalist and jumping into the opportunity, I didn't educate myself fast enough on AI, so I was late on that. But that, you can't dismiss that that started a bull market. That probably started in like March, because I was really bullish tech in December, January, and I kind of jumped off in you know, March, April, I jumped off. And that's when the whole uh, chat GPT gave it another leg, mm. which is still ongoing. I mean, that's a very big theme that can play out for a long time if you think about it. So there's always something to buy and there's always something to sell. Mm. And on the other hand, you look at bonds. I mean, bonds have been trading terribly for the last 12 months. You know, are they in a bear market? Well, we had like a 40 year bull market in bonds. So yeah, you can't say we're in a bond bull market now. And we, bonds we, and stocks are signaling very different things. Too, very different. Another... So divergences is the, <laughs> one of the words of 2023 for me is divergences. Like you put a divergences, bonds versus equities, massive. Like I haven't seen something like that. Or the yield curve versus equities. Okay, the yield curve is a bit of a tough one. So I'm, I rarely pay attention to the yield curve, but you know, it's signaling something else. We're the most inverted we've ever been. So mm -hmm. things are not normal. <laughs> Another divergence was, I'm just trying to think, well, Chinese tech stocks versus the NASDAQ as, as well. Hmm. Trying to think what else. Of course, there are unique circumstances in China Absolutely, that would make yeah. for that. Absolutely. That occurrence. Yeah, but it goes back to the point. There's always something to buy, something to sell, yeah. So I'm going to move us to the second hour, Shrub. We're going to talk about oil and the bull case for oil and commodities more broadly. We're going to talk about AI. We're going to talk about aliens because I've been talking to everybody about aliens in the second hour. I asked Peter Atwater about it. I asked Neil Howe about it. So I'm going to ask you about it. I actually think it's very interesting and relevant. I mean, I have some ideas about how to make that more interesting. Maybe we combine the Fed pressures with the alien testimonies on Congress. Who's more believable? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of interesting ways in which to make you could make great content from that. As a content creator, I can tell you. Gothilocks and Goldilocks, people who know you will know what I'm referring to. 
People who don't will be interested. End of the dollar memes, realities, practical implications, and what actually is relevant to focus on. That also brings up, you know, BRICS common currency and can we actually, wait a minute, if we can't get euro bonds in the European Union to make this optimal currency union work, how exactly are we supposed to do that if we have these far-flung economies with different national security objectives? The European Union, opportunities in Europe for investing, inflation versus deflation. We talk, And then again, the divergence between bonds and stocks, kind of trying to square that circle is something that I want to talk about in the second hour, as well as gold. I want to get your opinions on gold. And uh, I think in an interesting way, this might be the worst podcast ever because we did a really crappy job making this the worst podcast ever because actually it was pretty good. So <laughs> for anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Le Shrub, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Shrub, stick around. We're going to move the uh, second hour of our conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.